I'm stranded in the desert. It never rains, there's no trees to be found, and the only animals around are these dumb rabbits. But this is no normal desert. This is one of Minecraft's secret super flat challenges. I'm on a quest to beat them all in hardcore mode, and this will be the hardest one yet. Let's do this. After taking a quick look around, I sprinted towards the nearest village, grabbing some sticks from the dead bushes along the way. There were hay bales that I could craft into bread, but in order to do so, I needed a crafting table. Okay, let's see what's in this tower thing over here. Actually, this was my second attempt. On my first try, I got a about 10 days in before dying. So I was actually feeling extra confident in my early game plan. So confident in fact that I was just jumping off towers willy nilly. I found the crafting table I needed in a small hut and then I cheesed an iron golem so I'd be able to craft a bucket. Excuse me sir, do you have a moment to talk about our lord and savior? I grabbed some water from the village well and carried it to the closest lava pool I could see. This should make it super easy to build a portal. But first I wanted to breed the nearby cows since they're actually kind of rare. Cows, sheep, pigs, and camels don't spawn anywhere except for within the village animal pens. So I have to make sure to keep these guys extra safe. I slayed another iron golem to make an iron pick, and then I grabbed some cobble from the lava pool to use for crafting more tools. I managed to get some of the portal built, but before I could finish, the monsters in the night forced me to take cover. After being chased around for a while, I managed to get to my crafting table and craft an iron sword. And for the rest of the night, I took shelter in a house and crafted some more tools with the cobblestone I got. Technically, that was only day zero. The warm-up day, if you will. We've still got a hundred more days to go, and I have no idea how I'm gonna get wood yet, let alone kill the dragon. And we're not stopping there either. To fully complete this challenge, Challenge, not only do I have to beat the game, but I'll also have to defeat the wither and make an epic base. Only then can I call this preset truly conquered. With all of these upcoming challenges looming in my mind, I quickly finished building the nether portal, but I realized I had no way to light it. Luckily, I did something sneaky that should help. I actually started this world in version 1.17. This was the Minecraft update before the world height was lowered, meaning the generation was slightly different. If you have one of these older super flat worlds, when you upgrade past 1.18, you'll get loads of different structures you wouldn't otherwise get, including the pillager outpost and ruined portal. I can get wood at the pillager outpost and then use lava to light it on fire and ignite the portal. Or if I'm extra lucky, I could even find a flint and steel in a ruined portal chest. So I set up a quick home base around the portal and geared up to go search for some structures. But just in case I got unlucky, I put a little dead bush between the lava and the portal. I don't know if it's possible for these to light on fire and ignite a portal, but you know what? We're trying it. Okay, I see a desert temple. I'm gonna go see what we can find. Don't blow up, don't blow up, don't blow up, don't blow up. Oh, new smithing template, I should use that. Yeah, spoiler alert, I forgot to use that. I kept venturing forth, but the sun went down before I could find any new structures. But finally, after running for half the night, I spotted a ruined portal in the distance. Let's go! The chest was stocked with not one, but two different ways to light the portal. It looked like I'd be in the nether in no time, which would finally give me access to all that sweet, sweet hyphy. <clears throat> The, the wood. Anyhow, I went back and lit the portal and found myself in a crimson forest biome. I quickly grabbed some crimson wood and then retreated back to the overworld before any hoglins could ruin my run. Then I crafted a shield and helmet with some of the iron I got from the desert temple so I'd at least be a little bit more prepared in case of poor scene ambush. Since there were tons of mobs out, I decided to just spend the rest of the night digging a hole to collect some blocks. When the sun came out, I crawled out of my hole, just like I do in real life, and I went to the cow pen to go grab the dirt. As far as I can tell, this stuff can really only be found in these village pens, so it's actually pretty valuable. Okay, editor mog here. It turns out way at the bottom of the world, there are a few layers of stone where stuff like dirt, gravel, and even different ores can spawn, but I didn't realize that until after I finished the 100 days. So consider this like the extra hard version of this challenge. Anyways, I used the dirt to start constructing a villager breeder, but I quickly ran out, so I ran to a nearby village to grab some more. I spent the rest of the day working on building the farm, and by the next morning, it was basically done. <sighs> I just need carrots. Why is it always carrots? So the next day, I headed east in search of carrots, and my journey brought me to to another desert temple where I found two diamonds. I found a camel in the next village I passed through and in the distance I spotted a pillager outpost. So I saddled up the camel and took off for the outpost. I think I'm gonna call him Camelot. <laughs> <laughs> the most creative camel name in history. On the way, I stopped at another temple where I got another gapple and more smithing templates. But then it was time to hop off Camelot and race into the danger zone. Since there are no caves, pillager outposts spawn pillagers like crazy on super flat worlds, especially in the daytime. So I had to make a mad dash to the top. The risk was worth it though, because I got the carrots I needed, plus a goat horn and some new smithing templates that I definitely didn't put in a chest and forget about for the rest of the 100 days. After tooting my new horn and grabbing some more dark oak, it was time to attempt the risky descent. Oh, oh, oh God, there's so many, there's so many. Go, 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 go. 
but I managed to escape relatively unscathed and Camelot and I began heading back to the base. I noticed that the village where I found him had a pig pen, so I marked down the cords so I could return for them, and then I made my way home to clear out my inventory. I planted all the carrots in the villager breeder and then bone mealed them to try and fill up the farm, but I still didn't have enough, so I crafted some iron armor and fought skeletons for their bones, and I was able to finish filling in the carrots by the morning. It was becoming apparent that killing random iron golems would not cover my iron needs, so on day four I decided to start working on an iron farm. The first step was to collect some building blocks, so I dug out a bunch more sandstone from that random hole I made. I also moved another villager into the breeder so that hopefully by the time I needed villagers for the iron farm, they'd be ready to go. For the rest of the day, I collected some wood from the nether and then I made a quick cobble farm so I could keep replacing my tools. For the next two days, I worked on building up the iron farm until all that was left was getting the villagers and zombies into place. And luckily, the villager breeder was actually working, but moving mobs around at night was proving too hazardous, so instead I spent the rest of the evening lighting up the area to make it a bit easier. The next day, I was able to start moving the villagers into place and by the end of the day, I had three villagers on each side. All that was left was to get the zombies in place, but that would have to wait until nighttime. So while I waited for the sun to go down, I decided to start building a mob farm. The cool thing about building in the desert is that you can kind of just carve things out of the ground. By using torches to get rid of the sand, I was able to go way faster. I feel so five head right now. But before I could finish off the farm, nighttime had fallen and the zombies began spawning. I realized I was super unprepared for this because I had no minecarts or rails at all. So I quickly killed some iron golems and then caught my first zombie in a boat. I wanted to give my zombies helmets so they wouldn't burn in the daylight, but I didn't have enough leather and I almost died trying to get some. So I gave up on the helmet idea and just decided to put a little roof over the zombies instead. I didn't have enough time to move the zombies before the sun came up, so I decided to just go back to working on the mob farm. I took a quick trip to the nether to grab some wood for trapdoors, and then I was able to finish digging out the farm and get the water streams in place by nightfall. With the sun down, it was time to return to the zombies once more. I needed one more minecart, so I headed to the next door village to hunt for an iron golem. While I was there, I noticed there was a sheep pen, but unfortunately there was only one sheep. Oh no, his comrade has fallen. You can't be bred, so you're dead to me. After that, I found and slayed an iron golem, but a creeper blew up my iron before I could even pick it up. What? No! I, ugh. Lucky for me, another iron golem had spawned in my village, but even after taking his iron, I still didn't have enough for both rails and a second minecart. So transporting the zombies would have to wait one more day. Since it was day 10, I made it my goal to get both the mob farm and iron farm working by the end of the day. I spent the day putting a roof on the mob farm and finishing up the trap doors, and by nighttime, the only thing left to do was the drop chute. I started digging out the chute, but my pick was about to break, so I decided to move back to the iron farm. Once that thing's ready, I won't have to worry about my tools breaking again. But sadly, I couldn't find any more golems around to get me the missing iron I needed to move the zombies. So unfortunately, I didn't get either farm working by the end of day 10. But hey, that's okay, you know? I was only even more determined to finish both them up. I went back to digging out the drop chute for the mob farm and somehow a little cat got down there. Oh my god, I love this cat. I'm gonna name him Plummet. Hi, Plummet. Plummet and I finished up the drop chute and I was able to knock out the lights in the mob farm. In theory, it was working, but I didn't really have time to stick around and make sure because I finally was able to kill one last iron golem and get the minecarts and rails. I worked all night to get the zombies in place and although the phantoms made sure to make it as horrible as possible, I was still able to get it done by the morning. Yo, Enderman versus Iron Golem! Get him! Get him! Get him! Oh. <laughs> After watching that intense early morning brawl, I spent some time cleaning up the Iron Golem farm a bit and adding hoppers to the storage. Finally, I was in the Iron Age. I knew I kept this lava pool for a reason. With those farms finished, I decided it was time to take on the Nether. Fortunately, the Nether Fortress was super close to my portal, and it really didn't take long at all for me to find a blaze spawner. These guys have ended a few of my hardcore runs, so I just took my time and spent the whole day slowly but surely getting nine blaze rods. By the time I made it back to the base, it was day 13. I used one of the extra blaze rods to craft a brewing stand, and then I decided to check on the mob farm. Oh, it's working beautifully. You love to see it. I crafted some hoppers to make a quick collection chest, and then returned to the nether to look for a warped forest. These biomes spawn lots of endermen, so it's a perfect place to get enderpearls fast. I was super careful to boat the endermen before attacking them, just to ensure I wouldn't die. I spent a bunch of time doing that, and by day 14, I had collected a baker's dozen of pearls, and I was ready to return to the overworld to craft the eyes of ender. When I got back, I noticed that some of the golems from my iron farm were actually spawning on one of the villager houses, so I had to demolish it before I could gear up for the dragon fight. But with that done, I started my preparations. I crafted new tools and armor, grabbed plenty of food, and made sure that I had my gapples ready to go just in case. With that, I took a deep breath, through the first ender eye and set off. I decided to leave Camelot behind and set my bed so I could quickly return to my base after the dragon fight. On the way to the stronghold, I looted a few desert temples where I found a notch apple, some more books and smithing templates, and some diamonds. By the time I made it to the stronghold location, the sun had come up on day 15. Okay, I think it's right around here somewhere. Bullseye. 
Okay, I'm just making a portal real quick so it's easy to get back here. <sighs> Are you kidding me, dude? There better be more water in here. Okay, here we go. All right, let's see where this goes. Oh, we've been here before. This is perfect. Now that I had a super easy way to get back to the end, there was no more procrastinating. But before tackling the dragon fight, I decided to unwind with a bit of my favorite anime. For years now, I've been on a journey, an endless struggle to find the very best Minecraft server host. Along the way, I've made hundreds of friends, but I've also made countless enemies. So now, I can't hold back. It's time to show my true potential. It's time to bloom! But seriously, huge thanks to Bloom for sponsoring the video. I really do think they're the best Minecraft server host around, hands down. They've got advanced features like server splitting with a user-friendly panel and great support. So head on down to the link in the pinned comment and use code MOG25 at checkout for 25% off your first month. Okay, no more stalling, time to fight this dragon. Mamma mia, here I go again. You've all seen a dragon fight before, so I'll just show you the highlights. I had to do a water bucket clutch, which I was pretty proud of, not gonna lie. And I also had a crazy close call with an Enderman but I managed to boat him just in time. Otherwise, it was a pretty standard fight and I was super relieved to have one of the hardest parts of this challenge behind me. I wasted no time in heading for the Outer End Islands because I want to get an Elytra ASAP. Even if I'm not able to get sugar cane from Wandy T for rockets, I can still glide around and prevent myself from dying from fall damage. I immediately spotted an End City in the distance, so I tried purling over, but I missed. Okay, that could have just ended my run. But I'm not one for learning lessons, so I gathered up some blocks, bridged out a bit, and tried again. Nice. There we go, that's what I'm talking about, baby. By the time I reached the end city, another day had passed. I made sure to take things really slow, since these shulkers can hurt if you're not careful. But luckily, the loot chests were full of enchanted diamond gear, so as I made my way up the towers, I was getting harder and harder to kill. To my delight, this city had an end ship, and I was able to board the vessel by using a combination of shulker levitation and clutch MLG gamer skills. Alongside the elytra, I found a crazy good diamond sword and yet another type of smithing template. I made sure to stick around and get plenty of shulker shells before leaving the end. I looted another end city and then a third one with another end ship. I got tons of diamonds, full diamond gear, another elytra, and a super nice shovel. All in all, I was very happy with my haul. By the end of the day, I managed to get back to my base safely with all the loot and I spent the next morning organizing everything. That night, I decided to officially start working on an epic base, which I did by digging a big hole. I'm not really sure what this base will be yet, but I have this vision of like a big pyramid thing sunken into the ground with blue water and a lush garden oasis. After digging through the Night, I made some temporary holes to keep my animals. I got the cows into their hole, but I still didn't have any pigs or sheep yet, so it was time to go find some. Camelot and I set out, and I returned once more to that lonely sheep. I tried to lure him home with some wheat, but it was painfully slow, so I decided it would be better to just craft some leads. I actually had some slime already, because that random hole I dug in the ground happened to be in a slime chunk, but I needed to wait for nighttime to get some strings, so I decided to keep exploring. Turns out I didn't need spiders at all though, because I found all the string I needed while looting another desert temple, so I crafted the lead and managed to get the sheep back home, and then I chose a new direction to explore. The next village I found had another camel, so I decided to bring it home in case I ever want to make some camel babies. Plus, I'm sure Camelot will enjoy having some company. I made it back to the base with Camella by day 20, but rather than keep looking for pigs and sheep, I decided to take a little break to continue work on the base. I started by making a big grand staircase in front of the Iron Golem farm. Then I got a bunch of sandstone walls and started making a big square using the Iron Golem farm and the mob farm to figure out where the center should go. I continued digging sand through to the next day. Then while I was typing up my notes for the day, a creeper nearly ended my entire run. Oh! Oh, thank goodness I had all that diamond armor. I took a quick break from digging to grab some terracotta from the village to use as a highlight block for the base. And then when night fell, I headed down to the mob farm to convert it to an XP farm. It seemed like I had miscounted somehow with the drop shoot though, and it was way too deep. I had a bunch of really close calls trying to fix it. And by the time I was done fiddling with it to make sure the mobs would die in one hit, another half day had gone by. So I decided to start a brand new project that night, which is kind of totally unnecessary, but really fun to have. A cactus farm. 
farm. I mean, how can I not have a cactus farm on a desert world, right? Even though I had to deal with mobs harassing me the whole time, I finished the basic structure for the first level of the farm by day 23. Then I added in the sand and created an infinite water source just to make the water channels easier to create. But since it was still daylight, I wanted to do a bit of XP farming to try and repair my shovel as much as possible before mobs started spawning at night. So Plummet and I hung out for a bit while I did that. Man, you really like me, huh? Should I tame you? Nah. I went back up to the surface to do a bit more digging for the base when I heard the voice of a familiar friend. Right away, I was so happy to see cherry saplings for sale. Finally, I could have an easy source of wood. He also had sea pickles and drip leaves, so I bought some of each. Yes, oh, we finally have wood. It's so beautiful, so majestic. All right, back to work. I started working on the collection system underneath the cactus farm and started smelting some sand into glass to use for the water streams. At the end of the day, I decided to check how much iron we'd gotten so far. Hey, not bad. We'll have a beacon in no time, or, or at least the base for it. <laughs> the next day, I was kind of in the mood to mix things up, so I decided to go on another hunt for pigs and sheep. So I grabbed my leads and took Camelot to the coordinates of the pig pen we found all the way back on day three. But rather than take them straight back to the base, I pressed forward to try and see if there were any sheep in a nearby village I could take back at the same time. My plan worked out great, because I soon located some sheep a few hundred blocks away and was able to lead one back to the pigs. There was only one fatal flaw in my plan. I only had two leads. I had accounted for this when I left, however, by bringing a slime ball with me. So all I needed was two more string and I'd be golden. I mined terracotta while I waited for nighttime, but it was just taking so long and I'm, I'm not proud of this, but I figured out how to get the string I needed early. I, you didn't see anything, okay? In fact, anyone who comments about this, just gaslight them. What black hat? There's no black hat in the video. What are you talking about? My three amigos and I made our way back to the base and I was finally able to fill the empty animal pens. I bred the animals and then went back to working on the cactus collection system with the glass we smelted for the remainder of the evening. In the morning, I put the hoppers and chests into place and then I fed my animals once more. Then it was time for another nether wood chopping mission. This time it wasn't out of necessity, but for aesthetic reasons. I'm gonna need a bunch of fences for the cactus farm, and I think the warp wood will probably look the best with sandstone. Okay, this should do it. Now we just need the fences and the cactus. With the farm so close to being functional, I decided to dedicate day 26 to getting it up and running. I placed in the fences and then the cactus, and with that, the first level was finished. With the pattern memorized, I was moving much quicker, and the second layer was pretty much finished by Sana. It only took a few more minutes to complete it, but I decided to hold off on doing more layers for just a bit. Instead, I began working on one of the last major farms we needed to get done before I could focus on base building, an automatic crop farm. This would hopefully give me a pretty easy source of emeralds, but first I would need enough dirt to actually make it. So I tried going to the nether to search for gravel, but I couldn't really find much. I wanted to duplicate my dirt by crafting it into coarse dirt and then converting it back to farmland. But when it became clear that gravel wouldn't be so easy to find, I just headed to some nearby villages to steal the dirt from the farms instead. I spent the next day continuing work on the farm, but I still needed more dirt, so I took one last soil search and after that I was able to get all the farmland filled in. I put carrots on one side and potatoes on the other so we could farm both and everything was basically ready to go for the villagers. Time to wrangle me some testificates. Wrestling with the villagers took basically all day, but I got it done nonetheless. All right, I think we just need to wait for their inventories to fill up. After finishing the farm, I spent the rest of the day digging sand and I started clearing out the lava pool in my base so I could safely dig out the sand beneath it. I finished clearing out the lava the following day and then I moved my nether portal down to the level I want the base to actually be at. At this point, I was pretty sure I wanted to move my villager breeder as well, so I made sure to leave enough room for that at the center of our base perimeter. I was super careful when laying out the location of the breeder so that once I moved the villagers, I wouldn't have to do it again. With the foundation for the new breeder in place, I was ready to start dismantling my little shelter and moving everything down. So I took down the walls, trying not to tear up, and then I moved all the dirt from the old breeder to the new one. After the soil was tilled and the carrots were planted once again, I reconstructed the little chamber that holds the baby villagers, and I was pretty much ready to move the villagers to the new farm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. Time to wrangle me some testificates. Moving the villagers into place was an all day affair. I spent a bunch of time creating a pathway for them to travel along, and then when night fell, I placed some beds down to lure them towards the holding chamber. Oh my god, these guys are so annoying. The villagers were way too hard to move without the beds at night, so I decided to spend the day on other stuff and come back to it once the sun was down. I spent some time repairing my shovel again, and then I worked on clearing out tons more sand. At this point, I had a big enough hole dug that I could sort of start mapping out the actual structure of my base. I want to have a little moat around the pyramid 
pyramid structure, so I started figuring out the exact spacing for that. Once it was night, I took some time to take extra precautions with my villager path. Then I added some trapdoors to trick them into thinking they could walk to the bed. It worked like a charm, and they all marched their butts right into the holding chamber. I can't tell you how happy I was to have that done with. Before the next day, I decided to see if the crop farm was working, and it sort of looked like it was, but very slowly. We'll come back to that. The next morning, I put some cactus in the oven to smell, and then worked on grabbing some of the villagers from our holding cell with minecarts. I used that brewing stand we crafted forever ago to get a cleric, and then I tried rolling for a farmer who would buy carrots and potatoes. Once I got one, I did some manual farming over at the crop farm so I could trade for a few emeralds. I also grabbed the dye out of the oven and turned my sheep green. I've got big plans for these sheep, you you'll see. I wanted even more emeralds, so I stopped by the mob farm to grab some bones to fertilize the crops. And while I was there, I grabbed some rotten flesh to sell to the cleric. I was finally able to level up my villagers the next morning. Then I bought some lapis from the cleric and made some cyan dye so I could turn some of the sheep cyan as well. But then I realized they were never gonna regrow their wool without grass, so I had to plant some for them to munch on. Camelot kept getting stuck inside the mob's pens and it was driving me nuts because they kept escaping when I tried to get them out. Okay, there we go. Camelot, you stupid idiot! Once I finally got him out of the way, I was able to finish dyeing my sheep. Now it was time to experiment with all the wool I collected. So in the Structuralist series with Hobby, we used cyan wool for the bottom of Goo Lagoon, and I really liked how it looked. I think I'm gonna do that here as well. What about if I try and use this for the grass? Does that look stupid? Huh. I actually really like it. Yeah, it's much brighter than the actual grass in this biome. I was pretty happy with both uses of the wool, so I decided to try and collect a little bit of wool every single day and slowly expand until all the grass and the moat were finished. I spent some time decorating with the terracotta I had collected from the villages, and I was really happy with how it looked as a highlight block. In my head, this base is gonna look amazing, but right now it looks like a mess. I spent the rest of the night digging more sand and lighting things up to protect my villagers. On day 36, I made it my mission to move all the chests to a more permanent place. But first, I spent the morning getting rid of all the ugly scaffolding I had used to transport the villagers. Afterwards, I chopped a bunch of cherry wood to use for chests and barrels. I decided to create a little sunken area in front of my nether portal that would hold a mini storage room. Moving all the items down to the new barrels took the rest of the day and some of the next, but it was totally worth it. Having everything a bit more organized just felt so much better. Once I was happy with the storage for the time being, I spent some more time carving out the bottom floor of my new base. The whole thing is sunken down a few blocks with some sandstone stairs, and I think it looks really cool and desert. The next morning when I went to breed my animals, I realized I was all out of wheat, so I went to grab some hay bales from a village and picked up all the terracotta I could while doing so. Then that evening I went to the nether to spend some time mining warped wood. I needed tons of the stuff to use for the border around the moat, so I continued chopping till the next morning. I guess one of my iron golems came through the portal, cause on the way back I witnessed him on a mission to clean up hell. Ro thinks he's gonna single handedly save the nether. I left him to it and returned to the overworld with about five and a half stacks of warped logs. I placed as many as I could, but finishing the job would require much more sand clearing. So I switched gears once more and spent the rest of the day excavating like one of those jungle survival YouTubers. A40 was more of the same. I managed to finish placing all the sandstone stairs to complete the lower level of the structure. Then after my usual morning break to feed the animals and shear the sheep, I started working on a ceiling for the bottom level. The more the ceiling I put into place, the cozier it started to feel. I was also figuring out how the outer walls of the structure should look and everything started coming together. I love it when a build just kind of builds itself, you know what I mean? I then took a break from building to slaughter some of my cows. Using the leather they dropped, I'd be able to craft the last few item frames I needed for the storage room. And that's how I spent the following morning. Pretty soon, all the barrels were labeled and looking nice. With that, I went back to digging and I started clearing out the back side of the base. The dig continued for most of the next day as well. I placed the rest of the warped wood border around the moat and then decided to do one more warped wood border to separate the grass from the sandstone path. At this point, the biggest thing stopping me from making fast progress on the base was my shovel's durability, so I decided I needed a better source of experience. So I threw several stacks of sand in the oven to get a bunch of glass for a quick and dirty blaze farm. While that cooked, I did a bit more digging and by the next morning it was ready to go. So I grabbed some materials and headed to the nether to start building. Right away, I dug down when I got to the spawner so I could plan out the outline of the farm without dealing with the blazes. Once I had everything measured out, it was just a matter of placing the glass on each side. I got the entire bottom half of the farm finished, but then I had to dig out the blocks above the farm, which is when things got a little bit dangerous. But my pick was quickly running out of durability, so I took a breather in the overworld to grab some of my other ones from our end city raid. Trying to finish off the inside of the farm was crazy dangerous. Ah, please no. Ow, watch it, bro. Ugh. 
why me? I completely lost track of time while clearing the last remaining blocks and fending off the blazes, but at some point it became day 45 and I placed a lava bucket in each corner of the farm to finish it off. The last thing to do was carefully put in the trapdoors in the collection area. And with that, the blaze farm was fully operational. I knocked out the remaining torches on the spawner to improve the spawn rates and then I spent some time repairing my shovel. This was the first true speed test of the farm. It only took about five minutes to repair half of the durability, which wasn't lightning fast by any means, but definitely a huge improvement from the snail pace of our mob farm. For only taking like three days to build, I'd say it's worth it. I was excited to get home and use the newly repaired shovel to dig tons of sand, so I did just that. Now that I could rely on my shovel instead of using torches to clear the sand, my rate of clearing drastically increased. By the end of the night, I was able to clear out enough room to finish the inner ring of warp wood that frames our walkway. I was just short on warp wood, but I got done what I could, and then I turned my attention to the second floor of our base. At this point, my plan was to move my animal pens to the second floor of the pyramid so they'd be nice and easy to access. Also, the constant bleeding of sheep over my head would hopefully remind me to keep shearing them whenever possible. After establishing the shape of the new pens, I went and tended to my animals. I wasn't really up for the task of moving them quite yet, so afterwards I did some more sand clearing and pretty soon my shovel was back on the verge of breaking. But instead of worrying about that, I took a moment at sunrise to just admire how far the base had come already. Man, I know it's only the start, but it's looking good. After morning yoga, I went to the nether to repair my shovel again. It took about eight minutes to fully repair it, so while I waited around for Blaze to collect, I widened the room out a bit just to give a better view of the farm. Before going home, I made sure to stop by the warp woods biome to get more wood to finish our little walkway border. I also grabbed some quartz whenever I saw it, just in case we need it later. I got back to the overworld just as we were entering day 48. The very first thing I did that morning was finish off the missing warped wood. There we go, that was gonna bother me. Then I put my newly repaired shovel to good use, digging out the raised path around our base. That's when I realized that our mob farm was actually a little bit in the way. I had clearly miscalculated when laying down the perimeter of our wall, but it was way too late to change things now that I had built the cactus farm on the center of the other side. So rather than move the mob farm, I decided to work around it and try to find a way to make it look somewhat intentional. My solution ended up being to turn it into like a mini pyramid out of sandstone stairs. Then I built an identical one opposing it to make it symmetrical with the staircase in the walkway. This basically took all day to pull off, but when I turned around to view the results, I liked what I saw. Oh yeah, this looks pretty good actually. After digging for the rest of the day, it was starting to feel like the end of the dig was in sight. This motivated me to continue clearing sand the next day. I was finished clearing the bottom level of the base, so my focus was mostly on the tiered walkway. I got most of it done, but at nighttime, I got pretty sidetracked by all the mobs spawning, and I had to take some time to light things up. The next morning marked the official halfway point of the challenge, and as I looked around, I felt pretty good about our progress. With one major goal done and another about halfway finished, I felt confident we'd have enough time to complete the challenge before the 100 day mark. I spent the next morning doing my wool chores, and I even tried putting a bit of astroturf on the second layer of our base to add some greenery. Not sure if I like it yet, but we'll see. Then I checked on the auto crop farm, which was still working abnormally slowly, but I thought nothing of it and I went to go trade with my farmer villager. Unfortunately, he had been tragically zombified, so I cleared out some space below the villager farm where I could set up a curing station. But in order to get weakness potions to do so, I would need nether wart, so I went back to the nether to grab some from the fortress. I figured I'd repair my shovel again while I was there, and I also kept my eyes peeled for any wither skeletons I could find since I still need to worry about defeating the wither. I found some diamonds in a loot chest, but there were no wither skellies to be found, so I called off my search. Sadly, I lost the footage for day 51, but it was fairly uneventful. I finished repairing my shovel, killed two wither skeletons, but got no skull, and then I finished clearing out all the sand from the base. Wait, I wasn't recording? <laughs> With the digging finally finished, I could really start to focus on decorating the base a bit. I also wanted to do way more villager trading. I think the one thing I did better in the Snowy Kingdom preset was to do tons of villager trading early on. I had great tools way earlier and it really sped things up a lot. That's probably my biggest mistake so far in this challenge, but hopefully it won't be enough to stop us from completing our mission. I worked on a bunch of small details for the facade of the base and did more work on the second level as well. The animal pens were almost ready by nighttime, but I got distracted putting all the waterfalls around the base and lighting things up with lanterns. The next day I killed some cows for food and then set off with Camelot to search for more terracotta and dirt. I need the dirt to finish off all the animal pens and I'll need loads of the terracotta for our little base highlights. Each new village had a good amount of both blocks and I made sure to grab some hay bales as well which would ensure I'd never really have to grow my own wheat to feed my cows and sheep. The expedition lasted all of day 53 and 54. I collected about nine stacks of terracotta and several of dirt before I finally started heading home. I made it back to the base on day 55 and after sorting out some of my 
stuff, I worked on placing all the terracotta I had collected. It made a really huge difference in dressing up the base a bit. I also placed all the dirt I had collected into the animal pens and placed a grass block into each one so that it would spread out. I really only need the grass for the sheep, but I figured it would look nice for the other animals too. After raising the walls of the pens to make sure the animals wouldn't be able to jump out, I was finally ready to start moving the cows. <laughs> look, I'm a Minecrafter, not a comedian, okay? Moving the cows took until the next morning, and honestly, I was too lazy to even bother with some of them. After the cows, it was time to do the pigs, which was much easier since there were only a few of them. Lastly, I moved the sheep over, and then I was finally able to get rid of the old animal pens, which were just about the last thing left from our initial temporary base. At first, I was gonna use the last of the four animal pens for chickens, but I don't think you can even get them unless a chicken jockey spawns or something, so maybe I'll use it for my camels instead. At night, I worked more on the raised path around the base by placing more of my terracotta and converting the floor to sandstone for a more finished look. Then the next day, I finally got rid of the cherry leaves that were lingering in the sky above my base. Afterwards, I wanted to try and get some copper, so I put some water down in my mob farm drop chute to hopefully convert zombies to drown, but I was getting super unlucky and only getting skellies and creepers, so I figured I'd try again later. I placed the last of the terracotta I had collected, and then I started adding a cut sandstone trim to spiff up the walls a bit. The next morning, I finished the trim and then moved on to placing all the water features for the moat. The little waterfalls just helped the base look more complete and interesting. I went over to my mob farm to check for a drowned again, and immediately it was a disaster. Oh god, no, why? No, 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 no. Dude, make it stop. This was such a big mistake. After almost dying, I was forced to retreat and disable the farm with some torches so I could go clean it up. It took basically all day to clear out the remaining mobs, rebuild all the exploded walls, and reactivate the farm. This time, I made sure to add trapdoors to the bottom, which should prevent skeletons from trying to shoot me, which is what caused the explosion. After the cleanup was finished, I ran into Wandy T at the base, and I was so excited to find that he had dark oak saplings. I went to grab some emeralds from the base, but by the time I got back, all that remained of Wandy T were some leads on the ground. Wait, a zombie got him? No, no, come on, man, this sucks so bad. This was pretty devastating because I really wanted the green leaves to decorate with. As much as I love the cherry wood, the leaves just don't really go well with the desert theme. This tragedy was a sign that things needed to change. For too long, I had been avoiding villager trading and none of this would have happened if I had emeralds on hand ready to trade. But first, I wanted to replace the exposed walls of the mob farm with sandstone to make sure it was a little less fragile. I really want to avoid any future mob mishaps because that sort of thing could easily end my run. I also decided that I wasn't in love with the terracotta next to the green wool, so I began to remove it and place it around the topmost walkway of the base instead. I didn't have enough to finish it off completely, so we would have to do another terracotta trip at some point. I wrapped up the day with some wool chores, but I became a little preoccupied with a zombie attack forcing me to stop and light things up a bit. On day 60, I dug out one last line around the base for terracotta in order to try to get an idea of how much I'll need in total. But rather than head out to get it, I remained at the base to do more villager trading like I said I would after the dark oak mishap. I spent basically all day fiddling around with the villagers and trying to set up some sort of villager trading hall in the base. Progress was pretty slow, I'm not gonna lie, but I was hoping it would go faster once I had a design established. After wool chores the next morning, I worked on the staircases on each side of the base. I want to put an enchanting room in the center of the second level, right above the villager breeder, so I began laying out where that would go next. Then I heard Wandy T show up again, but it was just to tease me. He had no saplings this time, and he was basically just there to yell at me for letting his comrade die. But I bought some coral from him, just in case we want to use it for something, and then I started putting water streams to decorate the second level. Using my mason villager, I was able to buy a bunch of bricks and make some large pots, which I began placing around the base. These definitely fit with the desert theme. The next day, I pushed Wandy T into a hole so I could steal his llama. They might come in handy for carrying stuff if I need to travel with a lot of items. I put them in the empty mob pen, and then I went back to work on building up the base. I planted some nether wart around where I want my enchanting station to go, and then when night fell, I worked more on the villager trading hall. I was pretty happy with the placement of my first four villagers villagers, and now I had a design that I could copy to the other side. To wrap up the day, I placed more of the big pots around, and then I added some small pots on top so I could put cactus in each one. That tiny pop of green really helps liven up the base a little. I really wanted to make some librarian villagers, but I didn't have sugar cane yet, so I was unable to craft the books for a lectern. So Camelot and I went westward bound with a mission to find a village library. On the way, I made sure to collect all the terracotta I saw. Alright, two villages side by side, surely one of them has a library. Neither one had a library. <sighs> I have so much dirt and terracotta, but I just need books. Oh, is that one over there? Yes, dude, let's go! Just in time for sunrise, baby. After raiding one last desert temple, Camelot and I hastily returned to the base. Oh, 
home sweet home. Right away I placed in the terracotta that was missing from the walls and I crafted a lectern and placed down the books for my enchanting station. I didn't have enough bookshelves for the full setup so I'd have to trade for the rest of them. So I went downstairs and wasted pretty much the entire rest of the day working on the villagers. Most of it was just wasted time. The villager kept refusing to refresh his job and then he escaped and the whole thing was just really unproductive. So I decided to get more villagers into place so that at least I could work with multiple at once. It was high time for a big trading hall expansion so I spent all of day 65 adding tons of new slots for the villagers on each side of the base. I set up some temporary railways to help me get each slot filled in. This process spilled over into day 66 and to be honest, dealing with the villagers stubbornness almost drove me to the brink. I finally got a villager into each slot by midday, and then I crafted some lanterns and began lighting things up as the sun went down, making sure to get rid of all the ugly torches. Then I worked on getting some new workstations made for the villagers, like a grindstone and a blast furnace, and I even did some resetting for a good book trade, but no luck. The next day I noticed I was almost done with all the green wool on the second floor of the base, which was a bit of a relief, cause we're two thirds of the way through the challenge and I've got only a tiny bit of the lawn in place. I still wanted to get that copper from a drowned, so I checked back on the mob farm, and after a solid 10 minutes of standing around, I only got the chance to kill like two of them. Some of the zombies literally just refused to drown. Eventually, I just got frustrated and gave up. Then I tried to do some resetting for a good book trade, but I realized that's like the worst thing to do when you're frustrated. So I grabbed all my terracotta and started filling in the last outline around the base, but I only had enough to get about halfway there. In desperate need of a change of pace, I decided to expand my cactus farm once again. This was a really refreshing diversion from my usual tasks, even though it's really pointless. I kept working on the cactus farm the following day, and I decided to just keep going until it was five layers tall. I was out of warped wood, so I quickly stopped by the nether before continuing on into the next day. After one last trip to the nether on day 70, I was finally able to complete all five layers of the cactus farm, which at this point was more of a cactus tower. Well, that was pointless. Since I was out of reasons to keep procrastinating, I went back to trading with my villagers. My crop farm was still too slow, so I wanted to grab some bones from my mob farm to do a bit of manual farming. But while I was down there, I saw some drowned, and I decided to try one last time to get that copper I needed. Finally, yes, dude, yes, oh my god. God. I eagerly sprinted back to the base to craft a brush with the copper, but before using it, I quickly made a fletching table to get a Fletcher villager before I forgot to do so. Sticks would be like the best trade I had going forward. But then it was time to get our brush to get the new sniffer mob. I was so excited because I really want to decorate my base with the new flowers. So I ran for the first desert temple I saw to search for the sus sand. I managed to get three pottery sherds, but no egg. The next temple I checked had a village growing into it where the sus sand would normally spawn, so that was a bust too. Seemed like I was going to have to travel a little bit further for the sniffer egg, so I returned to the base to grab my camel. Man, I love how this place is coming out. As I prepared to set out again, I had a random epiphany. I think the reason my crop farm is working so slowly is that there are too many villagers in it. I think there only needs to be one on each side. So I decided to give my theory a proper test. We'll see what happens. On day 72, I cleared out my inventory and took Camelot in search of the sniffer spawn secretly set within a suspicious set of sand. Some of you might have already guessed how this ends, but if not, I'll just show you this montage to sum it up. Yeah, that's right. The sniffer egg doesn't spawn in deserts at all. It's only in warm ocean ruins. No one told me, okay? It's a good thing I checked the wiki because I already spent two Minecraft days on this. But on the bright side, I had lots of cool shirts to use. I dejectedly made my way back home and did my wool chores, and then I cleaned out my inventory a little bit. To try and cheer myself up, I spent the morning experimenting with the new shirts. They actually look kind of cool, but they hardly make up for my lack of a sniffer. But I couldn't dwell. I still needed to defeat the wither, and I only had a quarter of the challenge left to go. So I headed to the nether to search for wither skeletons, but the fortress was completely deserted. Then I managed to get myself in a really dangerous situation with some piglins. <laughs> But luckily, I was able to pillar up and escape them, only to find that the fortress was still empty when I returned. But I remembered seeing another fortress in that warped forest, so I headed there. And I actually did find a few wither skeletons there, but still no skull. I spent a ton of time clearing out the fortress to try and encourage spawning, and I hunted down a pack of four skeletons, but still no luck. Then, after a bit more clearing, I got another four, but still nothing. After spending the entirety of day 76 skull hunting as well, I was beginning to panic a little bit. Even just finding wither skeletons was proving almost impossible, 
possible, and with looting 3, my chances of getting a skull were still only 8.5%. So after multiple days of grinding with zero results, I decided to just give up for the time being. I came back to the overworld, and then my elytra broke. Needless to say, my spirits were pretty low. I did my wool chores, got some more food, and organized my inventory a bit, and then I repaired my elytra with some phantom membranes. Then it was time to do some trading. After a little bit of rolling, I got a silk touch trade, and I decided to keep it. Then just a few rolls later, I got mending too. I was super relieved to be able to put mending on my elytra, so hopefully it wouldn't break again. I spent the next day chopping cherry trees and crafting them into sticks to get tons of emeralds from the Fletcher. I'm gonna use them to buy the last bookshelves I need for our enchanting setup. I wanted another Fletcher so I could trade more sticks per day, so I went to the nether and found some gravel to make another fletching table. I also finally crafted my enchantment table and put that into place. There we go. I love how the villagers are just chilling down there. I chopped up a bunch more wood, and when my villagers reset their trades in the morning, I traded for tons of emeralds. Finally, I was able to finish off the enchantment table setup. With that done, I decided to focus on doing more resetting for books. After several minutes, I got an efficiency 5 trade, so I locked it in. To be honest, I have no idea what happened to those llamas I stole from Wandy T. But at this point, I still had an empty animal pen, so I decided to move half my sheep into there and breed them so that I could gather wool faster. With just over 20 days to go, it was going to be a race to finish all the green and cyan wool. At the end of the night, I got back to wood chopping, and the next day I was able to buy an efficiency 5 book. I did even more resetting, and I got an unbreaking 3 trade as well. I was hoping to get some better gear going soon, so I kept chopping wood. <sighs> I feel like we're running out of time. On day 81, I was able to get efficiency 5, unbreaking 3, and mending onto an axe. Now I could get sticks to trade much faster. I once again spent the whole day doing so, and I really only took breaks to shear my sheep. By day 82, I was becoming a bit fatigued with chopping wood non-stop, so I decided to work on the base in the morning. I started building up the walls and the roof around the enchanting setup, but I wanted to use some warped logs as a highlight block, and I didn't have any left. So I planned on going to the nether that night to grab some. But while it was still light out, I did another round of chopping and training. Then I got plenty of warped wood for decorating, and I was back at my base by the next morning. I used it for this little trim along the roof, and I think it was honestly worth the trouble. After even more chopping and trading, I remembered to check on the auto crop farm to see if killing the villagers actually fixed it. And turns out it did, and I was able to cash in with the farmer villager. With all those emeralds, I was able to get those same three enchantments I had put on my axe onto a shiny new pickaxe. After that, I kept chipping away at the design for the second level of the base. I added in some little windows using stair blocks, and once again, I think it really fits the desert theme. The next day, after a little bit of villager trading, I sprinkled some more pots around the base. They really are like a cheat code for decorating. Then, while doing my wool chores, I realized just how great my new pick was for eating through sandstone. Oh, wow, that, that is nice. Next, I headed up to convert the sand path around the base to sandstone for a more finished look. There was a villager house in the way, but I really enjoyed plowing through it with my new pickaxe. I was about halfway done with the path when I got a bit distracted by a literal zombie apocalypse. <sighs> Leave me alone. Oh god, what the- After somehow clearing all the zombies out, I spotted some very recognizable llamas. Blue orchids were about the only good trade this time around, but I picked up the pufferfish too and threw them in my moat just for fun. I would come to regret this very deeply. I had just enough blue orchids to replace the cactus in the pots on top of the base. Wandy T seemed to like the change. While I was shearing my sheep, I saw such a cute cat that fell into the pen. But before I could even craft a fishing rod, I got stung by one of the puffer fish that swam up the little waterfall. Yeah, putting them there was definitely a mistake. I spent some time fishing, and then I was able to tame the kitty who had decided to name Oasis. Just don't ask her to play Wonderwall. After placing in a ton of cyan wool, the moat was nearly finished. As soon as it was done, I could dye the cyan sheep green and fill in the lawn twice as fast. It had already been almost 10 days since I had attempted to get the wither skulls, so I decided to go back into the nether for another attempt. With my new pick, I would be able to mine out the nether brick at the fortress at a much faster rate. But it didn't take long for me to become agitated once more. Okay, I've spent days at this fortress and I've still only killed 26. So I decided to do something drastic. I used the seed command to figure out the seed, and then I used chunk base to locate a nether fortress and a soul sand valley biome. In theory, I think these generate more skeletons. It was a bit of a hike, but I was pretty sure it would still be faster than staying at the useless fortress I was in. But when I got to the fortress, I was worried it was all for nothing. <sighs> There's just nothing here. This is bogus, man. But eventually I realized that a bunch of them were actually spawning right underneath the fortress. And from that point on, my luck changed. Yes, first skull, finally. Finally. Over the course of the next day, I grinded through a ton more skeletons and managed to get my second and third skulls. Even though the first one took forever, my luck had definitely balanced out. Only 59 total kill? Okay, that's actually not bad. I carefully made my way back home through the nether, mentally preparing for the wither fight ahead of me. I spent the morning of day 88 sorting out my inventory and brewing some potions for the big battle.
Wow, these really do look like pea jars now. <laughs> I also planted some melon seeds that were basically sitting around in a chest this whole time so I could craft some glistering melons for health potions. While I waited for the melons to grow, I decided to outline exactly where I plan to put the beacon for the base. Did you know that the top of a desert temple has the perfect amount of space for a full beacon inside? That gave me inspiration to do something similar with the roof of our base. With the iron in place, all we needed was the beacon itself. But I wasn't about to die this far into the challenge, so I was gonna push off the wither fight until the very last. Minute. After one last round of collecting and placing in the cyan wool, the moat was finally finished. I made sure to dye all the cyan sheep green so that we can finish off the lawn next. I really want to get protection 4 armor before the wither fight, so I spent the rest of the day resetting another librarian. By the way, I just want to reiterate that these were a horrible idea. Can't stress that enough. Ow. 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 After another big chop and trade on day 89, I traded with my Fletchers for some bows and combined them in an anvil to create a somewhat decent bow for the wither fight. Then I covered up the base of our beacon with stairs to complete that desert temple look. Ow. I think it's pretty cool, especially in combination with the warped wood trim. I wrapped up the night by selling all the crops from the auto crop farm to the farmer and finishing up those health potions. I just have to say, glistering melon has got to be one of the most random items in the game. The next day, I returned to finishing off the path around the perimeter of the base. Remember previously I got interrupted by that zombie apocalypse? Well, this time I got interrupted by pillagers who presented me with an interesting dilemma. I could try and fight the pillagers in order to get a totem of undying for the wither fight, but the very act of trying to defeat the raid might just be more dangerous than the wither fight itself. But I decided for content, I would just go for it. But first, I quickly crafted some diamond pants and went to the blaze farm to get to level 30. Then I used the enchanting room to put a max level enchant on them, and I lucked out with unbreaking 3 and protection 3. My new pants emboldened me to attack the pillagers and run to the nearest village to initiate the raid. Unfortunately, I picked the worst village to do it in. It's been so long since I did a raid that I completely forgot it would end if all the villagers die, and I stupidly picked that weird temple village with only like two villagers in it. So the raid ended almost right away, and even though I was kind of disappointed, I was honestly more relieved than anything. With just 10 days left to the end of the challenge, it was time to wrap up all the last minute little details around our base. So I took Camilla on one final terracotta tour so we could finish the terracotta detailing once and for all. We set a northwesterly course since that was the direction I had explored the least, and in the second village I arrived at, I saw the most cursed Minecraft cactus I have ever seen. What the heck? Talk about heartburn. Looks like he got a little too much off his chest. Then, at the very next village I went to, I saw another extremely weird cactus. What? Me when I skip leg day, am I right, fellas? Who about this cactus really rings a bell? Collecting terracotta at night was super annoying, and I had to be really careful not to die. Dude, I had my shield up! I swear to God, if this guy kills me, I'm gonna freak out. <clears throat> Moving on, I kept hunting terracotta the next day without any major mishaps, and I began heading home as the sun set across the sand-swept horizon. The cactus farm was a beacon in the night, guiding me home to the task of placing the final bits of terracotta. It was super satisfying finishing up the pathway once and for all. Afterwards, I unpacked my luggage from the terracotta tour for a bit, and while doing so, I decided to place those ominous banners I got on what I considered to be the front of the base. It also conveniently points north, so it's easy to orient myself. I wrapped up the night with some good old-fashioned lawn laying, and then headed back to the storage room to grab some sandstone walls. I used them to make one last border around our perimeter path to keep any zombies from somehow pathfinding their way down to our villagers. It was a pretty dark day, which I think means it would have been a thunderstorm if not for the whole desert biome thing. But the gloominess inspired me to work on clearing out all the torches around the base and installing more permanent lighting fixtures. I mostly used lanterns on the base itself, and then in order to light up the lawn, I put down some shroom lights and hid them with green carpets. By the morning, as far as I could tell, all the torches were gone, everything was spawn-proofed, and the base was now safer than ever. Just in time for me to finish the 100 days and never play on this world again. <laughs> <laughs> on day 94, I decided to plant some cherry trees around our base and these little planters to sort of capture that oasis feeling. I'm not sure how well the cherry trees go with the desert biome, to be honest, but because of my failure to protect Wandy T, I just kind of have to live with it. I also wanted to put a glass pane window on the first layer of the cactus farm in order to prevent zombies from cutting through the farm and into the base. So I threw some sand in the oven and set it to broil. Then to deal with the lack of green trees, I decided to make some cool custom palm trees in the base. I wanted to use granite or andesite walls for the trunks, so I went to craft some. But I really I realized that I hadn't had a cobblestone farm since I took down my temporary base way back at the beginning. This whole time I was just living off what little cobble I had collected in the first few days. So I decided to repurpose the space I originally cleared out for the villager curing station. But before I could actually build the farm, my oven timer went off. So I grabbed the piping hot glass and headed over to the cactus farm to put panes in the first level. I decided not to do the rest of the levels, mostly for the sake of time, but I think it kind of looks cool this way. After all, I still have a lot of lawn to plant and now I need green wool for my palm tree. 
idea as well. Speaking of, I spent a few minutes building a quick cobble generator and then collecting a bit of cobble. Afterwards, I went to the nether to grab more quartz. Ow, I'm mining here. Then I used the quartz and cobble to craft some granite, which I turned into walls. Ow, dude. I think this will be the perfect thing to use for the palm tree trunks. I started building up a palm tree on each corner of the second level of the base. I made sure to carpet the top of the quote unquote leaves to prevent mob spawns. Other than phantom attacks, it was pretty uneventful. I've built lots of palm trees before, so it was pretty formulaic. It took me until sunset the next day to finish off all the palm trees, and I had to stop many times to shear my sheep for more leaves. But then it was time to admire my work. Ooh, I can't wait to see how this looks. Oh man, that, that really makes the base look so complete. With that addition, I was basically ready to call this base finished. Other than a few small details, we had completed our second goal for this challenge. Only one task remained, but I still had four days before I had to worry about that. All right, I think it's definitely missing more plants in those gardens. I tried placing some cherry leaves around the gardens, Ow. but it just didn't look right. Oh, if only I had green leaves, dude. Oh. But luckily, I had an idea. Unlike on regular super flat worlds, the desert super flat preset comes with certain features. There's actually a difference between features and structures in the game. Things like desert temples and villages are considered structures, but things like patches of cactus and lava lakes are actually features. And one of the features that can be found in the desert preset is amethyst geodes. Not only is this exciting because I can't get amethyst on my main world, but it might help me solve my garden problem. Most flowers can't be placed on the green wool I use, but the amethyst clusters can, and they might just look flowery enough to pass. But finding them before the time limit was gonna be really difficult. So I did what I had to do, and I crafted a piston. Using some highly advanced techniques that are definitely not cheating, I began to survey the ground beneath my base. But I could only see empty void. Below the mob farm was a similar story, so I decided to run even further away from the base to try again. I found some weird holes in the ground, and I decided to try there in case it was like a collapsed G Ode. Turns out it was just a lava lake, but I looked anyhow and immediately saw tons of mobs. I had a little suspicion it might be a mineshaft, but spotting two chess minecarts confirmed it. And so I turned subtitles on and began digging down, and after about two minutes, I was able to hit the mineshaft. If I wanted to find a geode before the challenge was over, I really didn't have time to be exploring mineshafts, but I just couldn't help myself. Things were a bit dodgy in the shaft, but I managed to work my way through until I was completely blessed with good fortune. I found the amethyst geode I was looking for attached to the mineshaft. Not only that, but it was next to those minecart chests. They really did lead me right where I needed to be. I was excited to find glowberries, which are actually exclusive to mine shafts on this preset, and some name tags, which I could use on Camelot and Oasis. I only found two name tags, but that's okay because something happened to plummet earlier, and also Camella just doesn't deserve one. Yeah, I said it. I got as many amethyst clusters as I could find, and I was shocked to find another amethyst geode right next to the first one. Or maybe it was the same one? The generation was really weird due to the mineshaft. But that didn't matter, because I got the clusters I needed, so I raced home to put them into our garden. I ended up replacing every other cherry leaf block with a cluster, and then I nervously climbed to the top of the iron golem farm to see the results. Oh wow, that's much, much better. I wasn't sure they would really read as flowers, but I think it totally works. It looks like some sort of desert cactus flower, but there was still one glaring issue with the base. We really gotta fix this weird gap in the roof. So that was my main task on day 98, but first I wanted to give my pets their new name tags. Oasis seemed very pleased. Good kitty. But Camelot had run off again and I couldn't find him anywhere. I couldn't waste any time looking for him, so I just got started finishing off the roof of the base. I started with the ceiling in the enchanting room, and then I took a quick break to lay down more of the lawn. At this point, I was closing in on the final corner of the green wool. I went back up to the enchanting room to add a ceiling lamp, but I ended up swapping out the cherry trap doors for warped instead, which I think looks much better. Then I used my glowberries from the mine shaft to put some vines around the entrances to the enchanting room. I didn't have enough for each side, but hopefully they'll grow quickly enough that I can fix that. I also used the pumpkin seeds I found in the mine shaft to plant some pumpkins opposite the melons. I think I might have had pumpkin seeds this whole time, but better late than never. Then it was time to finish off that weird gap in the roof. So I grabbed some slabs and water buckets and began filling it in with a small water feature retained by sandstone crenellations. That's these things. The next morning I spotted Camelot in the distance from up on the roof, so I went and gave the little ingrate his name tag and dragged his humpy butt back to the base. I made little posts around the grass courtyard so that I could tie him up and I wouldn't lose him again. It was also a good opportunity to place lanterns so I could get rid of the hidden shroom lights in the floor. I was painfully close to finishing off the green wool, which was pretty wild considering it was the penultimate day of the challenge. I really cut it close. After going back, and finishing up the water feature on the roof, my sheep had regrown their coats and I was finally able to plant the last few meters of lawn. Yes. 
I can't believe how close that was, but we did it. As evening fell upon the sandscape, I realized that in the morning I would finally have to fight the wither. Just for fun, I went to check the cactus farm to see how much we had collected during the challenge. Hey, almost three double chests, not bad. But with that, it was time to clear out my inventory and get all of my potions ready to go. At this point, I was so far in that I knew I wouldn't be able to scrap the video if I lost. So I did something drastic. I cheated, that's right. I made a copy of the world right before the fight so that in case I die, you guys will get a chance to pick up right where I left off and complete the challenge for me. You can pick up that world download as well as the Snowy Kingdom world, my world with Hobby, and my flat world all on my Patreon. I've been working really hard to add so much more, including Bedrock world download, loads, 4k wallpapers, schematics for all my builds, and that's just the start. So I can stop worrying about views and advertisers and algorithms and have more fun just making awesome super flat content for you guys. So if all that sounds good to you, please check out my Patreon. It really does help me out. But no amount of plugging could save me from the inevitable fight. So I dug down into a random tunnel, created an iron golem to tank some hits for me, and then I placed the skulls to summon the wither. Oh, ow. That hurt. Definitely still withered. I think he's almost halfway. He's gonna go into the sword mode. Okay, yes, 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 he switched. Okay, eat. Health. Okay. Strength. Oh, this is easy. We got him, we got him, we got this. Come on, I'm not even withered. I'm so good, I'm so good, I got this! Let's go, dude! Yes! Let's go! Oh, yes, and we got a Wither Rose, too. Let's go. Oh, I'm so happy. Is it day 100? Yes, it's day 100. We beat him, like, as the sun came up on day 100. Oh, that's so awesome. Ah! So that was it. 100 days and I had truly conquered this challenge, defeating both bosses and even making an insanely cool base. With nothing else left to do, I quickly cleaned up my base and then crafted the beacon. I brought a pot up to the enchanting table and planted the wither flower to remember that iron golem's ultimate sacrifice. Then I finished putting glow berries on each entrance. After that, I spent a bunch of time moving my sand and sandstone chests out of sight into the basement with the cobble farm. And with that, it was time to place the final block of our base. There we go! 100 days, challenge completed. Uh, uh, let's go for speed, I guess. Not that it'll do me much good now. Let me know if you guys are still enjoying this series and which preset you'd like me to do next. Without you guys, none of this would be possible. Thanks for watching.